The most obvious symptom in my life of disintegration uh, was same-sex attraction. So anyone who bears that symptom, and not all broken men do, but right. some do, and when, when, when that is present, when one becomes aware of that, as I did in late childhood, then there's many ways of interpreting that and many ways of trying to resolve it, Right. Uh, whether it's hiding it. Um, did you go through a phase of hiding it? Well, I think early on, it, it, you know, the powerful onset, uh, no, no means of interpreting it, really, I think, at 10 or 11. Right. Um, growing up in Southern California, kind of a good-natured, somewhat moral, but pagan household. So in yeah. California in the 70s, yeah, there, unlike 70s. the rest of the country, mm -hmm. there was already a kind of... I don't know if they called it gay pride at that time. Sure. Well, well, Stonewall, late 60s, right. New York. New York, right. So I'd say New York, L.A. Right. Were, were kind of hubs. San Francisco was its own, but kind of smaller and by its own arrogant assessment, more exquisite. Mm -hmm. But a small place. But L.A.'s big and sprawling and influential, as is New York. So I think that those were sort of the poles. Right. And I, I just happened to be in L.A. growing up. And so, um, so, in a sense, precocious, because now that's happening in all the urban centers of the West, you could right. say. Yes, absolutely. And anyone who would defy that or suggest that acting upon or, or identifying with and acting upon one's same-sex attraction uh, is is to be frowned upon would would now be countercultural. Absolutely. So very yeah. different in those days. Right. But I, I think I kind of caught a jet stream of of uh, owning my same-sex attraction as kind of an aspect of my identity. Of course, you can do that, but it doesn't, it didn't for me, I'll try to personalize it here, it, it did not integrate me. So the freedom to own it, you could say, if there's anything good about that, at least it's not investing a lot of energy and leading a double life. Right, right. And, and that's never a good thing. Right. So, so if, if one is a conservative Christian and at odds with this part of himself and kind of stoking this Christian thing and on the other hand being compulsed by the other, that's that's a that's a very difficult place to be. That was not my dilemma, but whatever freedom I had as a young man, and I'm talking here now at high at high school, uh, going into college, and so were, on. Were you living an active same sex attracted life at this point? Were you engaging in homosexual relationships? At yeah, this point? so that started in high school, then moved in with a guy in later high school. And then, the, and then that leading into the first couple of years of my university life was defined by it. And, um, but, but mindful all the while that something was amiss. How, so, can you put your finger, when you say something was amiss, can you try to put your finger on that? What was amiss? Yep. I think uh, the lure of, of, of new perspective relationship. So I had this roommate with whom, you know, we could kind of mess around. But we were both on the prowl, right? We were young. Right, right. And, and you could say in the male domain, two men, two, you know, sort of phallic beings, if you will. That's not going to make for uh, a kind of s sober, faithful. Right. You know, it's just sort of we're friends. We care for each other. We're caring people. But we are not satisfying each other. We're, 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 we're born to go outside of the mm -hmm, bounds mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. sort of fidelity. Right. And, and that was true of this roommate that I had. And was there a semblance of, of in your relationship, was there an assumed infidelity? Was there an assumed fidelity that you were going against? How was that working itself out? I think it was a, a special friendship where we both assumed infidelity. Okay. And that was kind of fair game. 
um, which you could say said, said something about the limits of our emotional capacity to, to be real friends at a deeper level, uh, even though I cared for him mm-hmm. and uh, cared for him for years until, until he died from HIV. Um, but in the midst of all of that, back to your first question, I think there was a sense of, you know, I'm, I'm longing for this kind of iconic masculine thing in this guy and these guys, and yet it's elusive. I come so near, you know, it's close to the bone and the skin and the eyes and the lips, but there's, I, it, and then it eludes me. And so it sort of, it draws you, it awakens something in you, and then it leaves you right. empty. Even though there was friendship, right. even though there was good intention, even though we were on a journey, we were seeking after something. And so my brothers, so my family, you know, good parents, faithful parents to each other, more or less. I would say my dad, more or less, but trying. Um, was it a Christian home? Wounded? In, no, 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 not a Christian home. My mother had was becoming a Christian. Hmm. My father was avowedly not. He was a professor and uh, agnostic. My mom kind of went along with him and then reclaimed something of her uh, original faith. But yeah, I'll just play that forward. And she did. She tried. But I would say we were we were more just pagan in our in our thinking mm-hmm. as a family, but 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 humanistic in a way as well. But um, in the midst of all of that, my two brothers, they became Christians. So the Jesus People movement was kind of the Holy Spirit was falling up and down the West Coast. So on, where are we mid seventies now? Are yeah, we, early seventies. Early seventies. Yeah, still. because okay. I was in the midst of acting all this gay stuff out. My brothers were a little older. They had their own problems. We were all we all had symptoms mm-hmm. of disconnectedness and kind of the myth that our humanism was really working. Right, right. It just wasn't working. So we were all acting out in different ways, including my brothers. But they, in their brokenness, kind of were just were were captivated by this Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and these kind of alternate communities, late sixties, early seventies that were becoming Jesus people. And so they both became Jesus people. And when they did, they changed. So, so I mean, thank God for those who surrender to this Jesus. Yeah. He knows their hunger. So whether or not all the structures and sacraments and everything else are intact, they were crying out to Jesus from a profound place. And that changed them. So they went from being aloof, kind of standoffish to this slightly effeminate younger brother who had internalized their kind of selfish, critical bullying Mm -hmm. as being, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, there is something wrong with me, right? It only confirms what you actually believe about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that isn't that fundamentally I'm bad, though I probably thought that then, but that there is something wrong with me. Like, it, it isn't, it isn't wholly right for me to be lusting after other guys and yeah, yeah. in my pornographic watch to know that I'm actually looking at the guy, you know, all that. It's like, you know what? There's something kind of weird about that. And that isn't because anyone's standing over and saying, there's something wrong with you. You're just going, there's something disordered in me. So there's a message out, obviously, in the yeah. culture today that yeah. says, that's not, you should embrace that. That's not disordered at all. Right. There's, there's something wrong with you if you're thinking there's something wrong exactly. with you. Yeah, the only problem with homosexuality is the one you have with it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and in, in this case, in the, uh, my brothers were actually key because I, I was cut from their cloth. We all acted out in different ways. I wasn't the gay brother. Mm-hmm. I just, in, in the positioning of things, you know, expressed my disconnectedness and my rebellion and my disorder differently than they did. Right. I think in, in, in the eyes of their sort of critical eyes, their own wounded, selfish, older brother eyes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
I think I, I mistook that as, yeah, kind of a confirmation of my shame in a way. But when they became Christians, they changed and they started looking at me differently. Mm. They started looking at me as, as someone like them wow. who needed Jesus. Wow. And, and they knew that they were just, you know, they were just getting by on a wing and a prayer. They had nothing to boast about. They weren't so realized as Christians. They were still getting saved. So I said, but, you know, do, do you need this? Like, and they would, and they then at that point were free to say like, are you, are you gay or is that what you're doing? Like, and it wasn't like, are you, right. you know, it was just like, what, what is it? What, what's wrong? So you felt an invitation from them? It was them? an invitation, and it was an invitation born of love, and it was masculine love, mm. and it was masculine love that was Comiskey love. Wow. It was from my family. Yeah, yeah you, it was familiar. It was familiar. But it was also new and something so different. New, new as an in invitational. Right. Like, I would have a place with you. Mm.